Over the past 60 years or so, radiators on locomotives have grown to an obnoxious size, and they only seem to be getting bigger. Just look at General Electric's modern GVOs compared to their U-boats from the 50s and 60s. On the original U-boats, the radiators were flush with the car body, but on later models, we saw the radiator start to overhang the long hood, but only slightly. Between U-boats, Dash 7s, and Dash 8s, the radiator didn't really grow too much. But with the introduction of split coolant on late model Dash 8s, there was a noticeable size increase, which translated to the Dash 9s. And then things just got out of hand with the introduction of the GVO. The same can be said for EMD. Their radiators also started out flush with the car body, but we then saw them flare out in the 1960s on SD45s, and now we have monstrosities such as this SD23T4. So what's going on here? Why are locomotive manufacturers, especially GE, making their radiators absolutely massive, while in some cases, simultaneously downsizing the amount of cylinders in a locomotive's prime mover? It seems quite counterintuitive. However, the answer to this odd question lies in basic thermodynamics. In this house, we obey the laws of thermodynamics! Before we get into the nitty-gritty of this, there's a few important concepts that we have to understand. The first one is that while heat is energy, it's kind of in a league of its own, and we call that league thermal energy. Heat is nothing more than the transfer of thermal energy from one molecule to another. Also, heat correlates directly with entropy, but that's a whole other can of worms that's also intertwined with the heat death of the universe, which we'll touch on later. Next, just like matter, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's always conserved, which is why heat always travels from hot to cold. But there's a limit to how cold things can get, because the laws of thermodynamics prevent absolute zero from being achieved. No matter what, even in the coldest, most barren regions of space, there will always be some amount of atomic movement. Now that we all understand the fundamental laws of thermodynamics, we need to know why engines need radiators and what they do. In thermodynamics and in locomotives, we have something called a heat engine, which is any device or even organism that converts high amounts of thermal energy, QH, into work, W. And because of the first and second laws of thermodynamics, that QH, that heat, has to go somewhere, so it's dissipated as low thermal energy, QL. All internal combustion engines are heat engines, along with steam engines, and even yourself. The problem with heat engines, specifically internal combustion ones, is that they're horribly inefficient. The absolute maximum thermal efficiency they can reach is about 50%. So at an engine's very, very best, half of all the thermal energy being produced simply dissipates into the engine block, instead of doing work on the piston. This, of course, causes the engine to heat up significantly, which is necessary for proper operation. But if the engine becomes too chaotic due to too much heat and entropy, things go south real quick. In short, internal combustion engines get hot because they're inefficient. Is it spring yet? Oh, I'm so c c cold that I'm shivering. <laughs> In the case of a locomotive, we keep the engine cool with a radiator, which dissipates a lot of heat real quickly by taking advantage of surface area and the first two laws of thermodynamics. The radiator would be represented as a coal reservoir in a Carnot diagram. Also, it's worth noting that this diagram is more representative of a Stirling engine or Hero's engine rather than a diesel. It shows heat being put into the engine from an external source, but diesels produce their own heat internally. So in this instance, I think it would be more helpful if we considered each cylinder a hot reservoir. I would say we should just combine the engine and the hot reservoir, but that might break reality. Regardless, when the hot coolant enters a labyrinth of tubes in the radiator, it comes in contact with an unfathomable amount of surface area, giving heat ample opportunity to disperse into the open air. This heat exchange process is further expedited by a very large fan, constantly blowing cool air over the radiator and its fins, helping the heat to come in contact with even more matter. However, this expulsion of heat increases the net entropy, or chaos of the universe, 
because when the diesel burns inside the cylinders, its potential energy is converted into heat and kinetic energy. And when the heat is expelled into the universe by the radiator, it creates just a little bit more chaos out there, putting us one step closer to heat death, whenever that may be. All right, now we know why engines need radiators, and we know what radiators do. So why have they gotten so big in the past 60 years? Well, look at the prime movers on road locomotives. Their horsepower has practically doubled in recent decades. When you increase horsepower, you ultimately increase the energy and heat being produced in the engine. Remember, the maximum thermal efficiency an internal combustion engine can operate at is only about 50%. So let's say you have a GE U25C with an FDL16 prime mover. For simplicity's sake, the engine requires a thousand joules of energy to run at notch 8. At maximum efficiency, around 500 of those joules would be lost. They'll disperse into the engine block as thermal energy and never be used for power. Now, several years down the line, the demand for freight's increasing and trains are getting bigger. So GE introduces the U36B. It's got the same FDL16 engine, but has 1,100 more horses and operates with 1,500 joules of energy at notch 8, with 750 joules of energy being lost to heat, drastically increasing the net entropy and temperature of the engine which starts to become detrimental. But you know what can bring down the engine's entropy and heat by keeping things cool? A bigger radiator. Now, some locomotives such as the 20-cylinder SD45 required a larger radiator because their engines were absolutely massive. And late model SD70Ms have a flared radiator because they have a split cooling system. In a nutshell, split coolant makes the engine coolant responsible for keeping other components such as the turbo or water-to-air intercooler chilled. However, more often than not, the reason a locomotive gets a bigger radiator is due to an increase in horsepower. But what about modern GVOs, Tier 4 Aces, and the brand new SD23 T4? Their prime movers actually decreased in size while the radiator either stayed the same or got bigger. So what's up with that? Well, GVOs, T4s, and SD23s are all oddballs in the world of locomotives. They've got V12 and inline 6 engines, where just about every other locomotive on the road has a V16. But here's the kicker. Along with possessing a split cooling system, these shortened engines have absolutely massive cylinders. On the GVOs and T4s, their bores are 9.8 and 10.4 inches, and their strokes are at least a foot long which leaves a ton of room for diesel fuel to burn and produce heat. It also leaves a ton of surface area for that heat to dissipate into. So now you've got a small locomotive engine rapidly producing huge amounts of heat. And with a few exceptions, small things are easier to heat up than large things because there's less matter for thermal energy to traverse. So a gargantuan radiator is required to keep things cool. Also, the increased cooling keeps the exhaust temperatures and emissions low making these engines tier 4 compliant. Thanks for watching. If y'all enjoyed this video, consider checking out some other ones of mine. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.